It's very, very difficult to see the world. It takes an awful lot of cognitive resources, it takes a lot of brain power, and that takes a lot of psychophysiological structure, and that takes a lot of resources and energy. So perceiving the world is a very energy-demanding and effortful process, and half your brain is devoted directly to visual processing. And the rest of your brain is integrally involved as well, even the parts of your brain that are responsible for action are responsible as well for perception. And detailed perception is even more difficult than low resolution and vague perception. And this is reflected in literally in the way that your eyes are actually structured. So when you're looking out at the world, the center point of your vision, that's called the fovea, is, uh, uh, is set up so that it's extraordinarily high resolution. And so when I'm looking out at the audience, I can look at one face at a time. And if I look at one person's face, I can see their facial features and I can identify them as an individual. But if I look at a given person, even the two people sitting beside them, as long as I don't glance directly at them, they're quite vague. I can only see the basic outlines of their mouth and their, and their eyes. And then by the time I'm five people away, I can just see vague shapes. And out here, it's basically nothing. And so your vision moves from extremely high resolution to lower and lower and lower resolution as you move out towards the periphery. And the reason for that is that it takes so much cortical resource to process the high resolution center that your brain would have to be the size of the worst alien you could possibly imagine for you to see other than a pinprick of high resolution focal detail. And the way that you overcome that problem is that when you're looking at the world, because you might think you look at the world passively, you know, because it sort of feels that way, but that's not exactly right. You do the same thing with your eyes that a blind man might do if he was trying to visualize that because blind people can visualize you know they just use their hands to do it to visualize the speaker you have to move to sample it and you do exactly the same thing with your eyes you there's no perception without action ever and so you have to now some of this is unconscious and automatic but you 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 use a lot of voluntary decision to determine where to look now Use all sorts of cues, you know, because you have to decide where you're going to expend scarce resources in perception. And one of the cues you use is other people's eyes. And so when you're talking to someone, you look directly at their eyes, typically, and that also enables you to take in their whole face and process their emotional display and infer their emotional state. But by looking at their eyes, you can tell where they're looking. And you want to look where other people are looking because other people are also calculating where you should look. And if you can just tell where they're looking, you know where you should look. And there's a famous social psychology experiment which you can run yourself. So all you have to do is go to a busy street and stand on a corner and just look up. And as you do that, other people will stop and look up. And then there'll be like eight people standing there and looking up, and then soon there'll be 50, because if eight people are looking, obviously there must be something worth looking at. And, you know, our eyes are actually, have actually evolved to facilitate that. So you, human eyes are, of course, black pupil in the middle, and then a colored ring against a white background. And the reason for that is because all of our ancestors who had eyes that you couldn't see either got killed or didn't reproduce. And the reason for that is that it's so valuable for us to know where to look that we've evolved so that other people can tell where we look extraordinarily easily. And so, now where do you look? That's the crucial thing. Where do you look? Well, you look at what's worth paying attention to. And what's worth paying attention to? Well, that's complicated, but you could reduce it to this. Do you look at what's important or what's irrelevant? Do you look at what's relevant and meaningful or what's irrelevant? And the answer is, you look at what's relevant. Now, how you decide what's relevant, 
That's a very difficult question. But mostly, see, mostly the problem of perception is mostly the problem of what to ignore. Right? Because there's an infinite number of things you could look at. The world's extraordinarily complicated. You can get lost in the details of anything, even a single object. And so mostly you ignore 99.999 percent is irrelevant. You ignore the floor. You know, you, you can do this as another experiment. If, you, if people are sitting in a room, maybe they're at a conference, and you say, okay, look up at the ceiling. What color is the rug? No one knows. Even though they might have been sitting in the room for an hour. And the reason is, well, who cares what color the rug is when you're at a conference? As long as the bloody floor doesn't move, you can ignore it. And so mostly we ignore everything that doesn't move, that doesn't change, and we focus on a very small number of things. A very small number of things. And then we move our eyes from one important thing to another, and we make a world out of the snapshots that we take. And we decide what's important by using a hierarchy of attentional prioritization. And that's the same as a structure of value. So, we look at what's important. And so, here's an example. It's a simple example. So, you know, if I walk on stage, you might say, well, what do you see when you walk on stage? And there's, like, if I look at the light reflecting off this variegated tile here, there's a multitude of colors, like I can see a whole rainbow of colors in the reflections on this surface. And if I just move like a foot ahead, the whole pattern changes. And I could just look at that forever. If I wanted to paint it like a photorealistic painter, it would take a month. There's just an exhaustible complexity everywhere. But when I walk in the stage, that isn't really what I see, you know, unless I'm on psychedelics. And, and I actually mean that technically, because one of the things psychedelics do is stop you from ignoring things. And so, I, I mean that technically. In any case, if I walk on the stage, what I'm going to see are chairs and a table, speakers, lights, the carpet. I'm going to see functional objects. I'm going to see tools and obstacles. I'm going to see pathways, tools and obstacles. And so, one of the tools that I might see is a chair. A chair is a tool for sitting. Now, that's a different way of thinking about a chair, because you might think, well, what make two things chairs? You'd say, well, the chair has a seat, and a chair has a back, and a chair has four legs. But you can have a chair without a back, and you can have a chair without four legs, and a beanbag is a chair, and a stump is a chair, can be, if you can sit on it, and a table can be a chair if you can sit on it, and a speaker can be a chair if you can sit on it, and so it's not an easy thing to make a list of features and say, this is a chair because it has this list of features and so is this. The reason something is a chair, most fundamentally, is because you can sit on it. And so, see, that, that doesn't seem like it's a particularly interesting fact, but it's extremely interesting because what it suggests is that all the things that announce themselves to you as objects, which means the things you literally perceive as real, are integrally tied up with your implicit movement towards a goal. So I come in here and I see a chair, and why do I see a chair? And the answer is, well, you can sit on a chair. And you might say, well, why would you want to sit on a chair? And the answer is, well, so you can have a rest. And then you might say, well, why do you need to have a rest? And the answer is, well, you don't expend as much energy when you're resting, and you don't want to expend excess energy, because if you expend extra energy, you need more food, and then if you don't have that food, well, then you suffer, and if you lack food and energy enough, then you die. And so one of the reasons that you see a chair is so that you don't die. Now, you know, the connection is somewhat oblique, right, because you're not starving, but there could be a time in your life, you could easily imagine this, where it's bloody important that you find a place to rest.